to start now the second session. Um, I think a very, very broad uh, uh, conclu conclusion of the first session is that there is some legitimacy of fiscal state aid. And we can all agree on that. It's not completely illegal. So the next question is, if it is legitimate, what exactly do we think uh, is meant with the notion of fiscal state aid? in an evolving European legal and economic system. That is the topic of this second session. And first, I would like to give the floor to Professor Daniel Smit, who is a professor at this university and also connected to EY. Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. In my presentation, I will focus on um, tax avoidance and tax avoidance measures uh, and the extent uh, to which this area is governed by EU state aid rules. Um, clearly, we are talking about an area here which has been developing under EU law tremendously over the last year, and it's still developing. Um, and we've seen that the, as a result of the economic crisis, um, large multinational companies are being accused of uh, not paying their fair share uh, by setting up international tax planning strategies. Uh, and in response, member states already have acted. Member states uh, have already have adopted, implemented, to some extent, uh, specific anti-avoidance measures in order to mitigate or combat international tax planning strategies by uh, multinational enterprises. However, all these with all these measures, the initiative is with the member states, meaning it's for the member states to decide how far they want to go in combating tax avoidance practices by multinationals. Um, in the light of these developments, the question becomes legitimate to what extent state aid rules are developing accordingly. Um, and this is an important question because under the state aid rules, it's no longer the member states that are in charge. It's the European Commission <coughs> that is in charge. Um, and essentially, um, <coughs> this tension, the question who is in charge, who is the boss, this question essentially is reflected in this quote which was already discussed uh, this morning. Um, where we see that the commissioner of the DG competition actually says two important things here. The first thing she said is we don't like tax avoidance, something needs to be done against that, but we see that the member states don't act, or at least they don't act sufficiently. So if the member states don't act in combating tax avoidance, we as a commission will act. So this raises a question of um, sovereign, who is the boss, who is in charge. There is another important um, aspect of this quote, which is in the second bullet, um, because what the Commission essentially is saying here that, okay, if the rules are not changed by the Member States, we will change, we will create a change by applying the stated rules to tax planning practices. There is, however, one important distinction between changing the rules through legislation, which normally only has effects for the future, so no retroactivity, and preparing or combating tax avoidance practices through the state aid mechanism, which by nature has de facto retroactive effect, because if the Commission finds out that the measure comes to the state aid, the beneficiary needs to repay the benefit as received over the last 10 years. So effectively, this boils down to re retroactivity. Um, and as I see it, is that the Commission tries to kind of stretch stated rules here by trying to achieve something, policy objective, common in tax avoidance, which normally should be done through legislation. Um, and then that raises, I think, a question of uh, concerns of legal certainty. Because indeed, if the Commission is going to proceed, and if, uh, the question then is, okay, uh, what, what, um, 
who decides uh, which, which amount of tax has to be paid, but more importantly, um, if the commission is in charge, it may determine how a uh, tax avoidance measure should look like, but that has then 10 years retroactive effect. So again, that, I think that raises legal certainty concerns as well. Well, this brings me to my, um, to my problem statement of this presentation. Are member states restricted under the EU status rules in their choice whether and how to design tax avoidance measures? Uh, I will address this question based on a couple of concrete examples. And I will mainly focus on this question from a legal point of view, a more legal presentation. And uh, as I will conclude, because um, I'm not sure whether I will make all the slides, but so let's already give my conclusion then. <laughs> Please, then we are... Uh, <laughs> Um, the member states are indeed to some extent restricted, but it's uncertain to what extent. Before discussing my question, or statement, I want to focus briefly on two important elements of the state aid testing framework, which is the element of selectivity and the uh, um, criterion of justification grounds. Both are very closely interrelated. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, but nevertheless they constitute two separate testing frameworks which have um, um, yeah, di different, different, different aspects. So let's first have a quick look on the selectivity test. The selectivity test, I think it's the most important one when we talk about fiscal state aid, um, actually boils down to uh, the question whether a certain group of undertakings or a single undertaking is treated more favorably in comparison to other undertakings that find themselves legally and factually in a similar situation. So it goes down to a question of discrimination, essentially. But also it goes down to the core question, before you can establish discrimination, you need to find out what the normal rule is, what the benchmark rule is. Because if you don't have a benchmark rule, you can't come to a deviation on that benchmark rule. There can't be an exception. You first need to find out what is the benchmark rule, what is your normal regime. And a burden of proof for that is with the European Commission. Um, interestingly, if you look to the case law of the court, the answer of the question, what is, how to establish your normal regime, it's not in, um, that the answer to the question is not a priori given. It depends. And there are several approaches. You can say, well, your general system should be as broad as possible. So if you talk for, about tax avoidance measures, you could say, well, your tax law as, as a whole, like the corporate income tax as such, should be your starting framework. And then every exception being made within that corporate tax law act constitutes a deviation, which means selectivity. The other approach is that you say, well, no, you have to approach selectivity by looking to the specific measure at stake. So if you talk about the tax avoidance measure, the question is, is that a deviation or a general rule? Or you should maybe even go one step further, saying, well, if there is, again, an exception being made on the anti avoidance measure, an exception to the exception, you should only, should, should only test that last, that first exception. Right? So, it's a very narrow approach. Um, I said that there is no clear answer um, a priori. And uh, last December, um, a very interesting conclusion was issued by the Attorney General Val. And he asked, well, during the oral hearing in that, in that case, the Commission was asked, how do you determine the reference framework? And the answer to the Commission was, well, we can't really explain that in the abstract, or at least it depends. Um, it described, the Commission described the process of finding the main room as a search for the logic in the system, which is, of course, very, very abstract. Now, I think there is a case of not determining the reference framework too narrow, because if you do that, you could even actually, what you were saying is that every exception constitutes a separate main rule. And if you do that, you are actually you know, making state aid rules completely meaningless. So I think indeed there is a case of 
um, um, determining the reference framework more broadly. However, if you do that, for example, if you say, well, the corporate income tax act as such should constitute your reference framework and every deviation must yeah, give them rise to sensitivity, that does mean that the commission has a lot of power potential. Because if you have a deviation, let's say a participation exception or a fiscal unity regime, which are all deviations on the Dutch corporate income tax as an, enti as an entirety, then you should, as member state, come up with a good justification for that regime, for that deviation. So you should justify the participation exemption or the, 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 the fiscal unity. <laughs> and the room of manoeuvre, the leeway member states have for justifying a measure on the state of regime is quite limited. We have some written non-tax related policy reasons that member states could, could, could rely on. These are listed in the treaty themselves, but in a, th th these are very limited uh, grounds. So in the, in the area of taxation, those written justification grounds, I think in m m most cases, will not be of any help for member states. Then there is also the concept of unwritten justification grounds, which means that member states also may justify selective treatment based on, I call it, tax policy reasons, domestic tax policy reasons. For example, the need to avoid international taxation, or the need to, to, to avoid tax avoidance, the need to achieve tax neutrality. So you can have tax policy objectives which may be justifiable. However, there are two important um, fine-tuning mechanisms for the Commission here. First, the Commission says, well, if you have a good tax policy reason, it must be proportionate. So we're going to, to apply, apply a proportionality test. And then if we go back to do the example for, uh, of the participation exemption, assume we have a participation exemption in place, which for now let's assume that constitutes a selective advantage because it deviates from the normal corporate income tax regime. That should be justified. Then you could say, well, it's justified based on the need to avoid double taxation. But what if the regime also applies to situations where there is actual no double taxation? Is that then still a justified measure? Should you say, well, if you believe in application, if there is no application, that's not proportionate. That goes beyond what is necessary to obtain, an object, to, to, to obtain the objective. But that might then be a problem for member states. And another requirement is the consistency test. Consistency. If a member state comes up with a tax policy reason to justify selective tax treatment, the Commission will typically assess whether that policy objective is the real objective behind the measure. And the Commission will kind of check whether the reasoning of the member state is really uh, inherently consistent. So if you say, well, we have an exception to this anti avoidance rule based on administrative simplicity reasons, and we don't want to make life too complicated for certain groups of taxpayers, that may be fine, but the Commission will then look, okay, if that applies to Group A. But now let's have a group, look to Group B, who also falls under the same anti avoidance group, who also may face administrative difficulties, but hey, there the exception does not apply. Why? So, and if the member states can't really explain that, the Commission may start doubting whether the objective, the tax policy objective raised by the member state is the real objective line behind the measure. And if the Commission is not um, convinced, the burden of proof in an area of justification grounds is with the member state. If the Commission is not convinced, it will decide, well, there's no justification. So, in the area of selectivity, it's, I would say, the Commission that has to prove something. But once you pass the gate of selectivity, it's up to the member state, and the Commission has all kinds of fine-tuning mechanisms to kind of steer, determine, to some extent, how tax measures, specifically tax avoidance measures, should look like. So, the answer to the final statement, therefore, heavily depends on how the Commission is willing or actually interpreting the concept of selectivity, the concept of Benchmarking, the main rule, finding your reference system. Broad approach versus the very narrow approach. 
and the way how the Commission will interpret the concepts like proportionality, how far the Commission will go into this consistency test. So the outcome depends on, on those two, two issues. Now let's go to some concrete examples, because I realize this, this, all this may sound quite abstract and theoretical, but let's go maybe to make it a bit more concrete to some uh, examples. The first example is quite straightforward, although dogmatically uh, I think it's quite difficult to but we have a taxpayer, taxpayer A, who is generally hit by an anti avoidance rule, let's say an interest limitation. It's behaving badly, so the tax avoidance rules apply. There is another taxpayer, taxpayer B, who has um, <coughs> who's not committed in a tax planning uh, event, no, no tax planning at stake, so he is outside the rule. He is outside the taxpayer. He is outside the tax avoidance rule. Um, so he can deduct his interest expenses. Taxpayer A can't deduct the interest expenses. Taxpayer B, the good taxpayer, can deduct the interest expenses. Can taxpayer A now claim or complain that taxpayer B is getting an advantage? Because hey, he can get deduction. Whereas I can't get the deduction, so my tax is higher than the tax is to be paid by my competitor. Is this selective? Selective treatment. I would say no, because how I, I would approach it is that from the angle of the corporate income tax as a whole, good and bad taxpayers, to put it quite roughly, are not in a legal comparable situation. They are different. So I would say you can't claim treatment of taxpayer B, because he's not comparable to you. Interestingly, the Commission and also the Court seem to accept, at least implicitly, that there is actual, actually selective treatment granted to taxpayer B, which then may be justifiable based on the need to prevent tax avoidance by taxpayers. That's strange. Because taxpayer B, good taxpayer, He's just following the normal regime. He's just claiming the interest deduction, which I assume it's the normal regime. Um, so where is the selective treatment then? So how do you can get to justification without selective treatment? So I think this example, which actually the Commission has published in its 2016 stated notice, is quite puzzling. I don't see really how the justification could come here into, uh, into play. Let's go to the second example, which is uh, maybe even more <laughs> complicated and puzzling. Um, it's a planning case. It's a case, a German case, which is now before the ECJ, Court of Justice. It's about the German anti avoidance rule, which aims at avoiding um, uh, loss trafficking. It aims at avoiding that companies that are no longer carrying on enterprise, an enterprise which have carried forward losses on the balance sheet, that those companies are sold to new shareholders, which then can start up new activities, and then buy losses, carry forward losses from someone else, which you can offset against your future profits. So by buying losses, actually the, the rule seeks to prevent the trade in so-called loss companies. Loss, losses, tax losses, they have a value. If you have millions of losses for the next couple of years, probably you won't have to pay any tax because you can offset the, your profits against all those acquired losses. So therefore the German rule says if a loss company is sold to a new shareholder, and if this uh, change in shareholdership is substantial, more than 50% change, then all the losses vaporize. No loss compensation in the future anymore. So your loss compensation rights disappear. This has an anti avoidance background to avoid trade and loss companies. However, the rule is quite tough. Simply more than 50% transfer of shares triggers the vaporization of losses. Now, this is quite rough, and that is also what German business experience during the economic crisis. A lot of companies almost failed, almost went bankrupt. But there are some um, other parties who wanted to buy those ailing companies in order to you know, 
restructure to, to give the, 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 the company a second life, so to speak. However, if you would buy this company, this alien company, uh, the losses would appear, disappear. So the German legislator said, well, yeah, we want to facilitate a little bit those takeovers of alien companies, because we are in a crisis, we need to stimulate a little bit our local economy, so let's make an exception to the rule. Let's, make, let's agree or let's put in a law that if there is a transfer in share in an alien company, the vaporization rule will no longer apply. The question is whether that is selective or illegal stated, whether this boils down to selective, uh, selectivity. The general court um, has answered this question with a yes. The court said the main rule here is you lose your carry forward rights, your rights to offset losses in case of a substantial shareholder, uh, shareholder um, a change in shareholdership. But that's the main rule. And we see that there is one specific exception being made here if there is a takeover in an alien company. And then all of a sudden your losses re, re, um, revive. So that's clearly selective. No justification because the reason, the real policy reason is not tax intrinsic. It's a non-tax policy objective to make sure that the German economy will survive. The court explicitly said we don't consider this a real uh, anti-avoidance rule because it's so rough that we see that just the mere fact uh, that you change, uh, uh, just the simple fact that you change ownership, that's, that should be the main rule. The Advocate General, because this case has been appealed, comes to the opposite conclusion. He says, no, no, no. The benchmark should be the anti, the anti uh, the starting point should be this is an anti avoidance rule. And there is some overkill in this rule, it's too rough. And the only thing the Germans are doing is reducing the overkill in the two rough anti-avoidance provision. So this is not an exception to the rule. Actually what you're doing is, since the takeover of any companies has nothing to do with act use, with tax avoidance, you're simply applying the normal rule, which says if, if there is a... Um, uh, which, at least according to the logic of the German legislature, is if there's no abuse, if there's no loss company, then um, then the rule, okay, then, then there is no tax avoidance. So the question here is, what is your benchmark? Is your benchmark you lose your rights of losses? Or is the benchmark you will always keep the right to offset your losses, unless there is tax avoidance? The yeah, general takes the second approach, which nevertheless gives rise to question, because if you say, okay, you may reduce overkill, that's fine, it should not be selected. And I, I, I have sympathy for that argument, but then the problem is, why, if you want to reduce the overkill in the provision, why do you, are you only reducing the overkill for one specific group, namely the alien companies, and why not for all other companies that suffer from the rule? which are not purely abusive, why not ext extending the, uh, the exemption to those companies as well? So is a selective reduction of overkill, is it still selective? I, I'm not 100% sure about the answer to that question. And let's go to the opposite example. Um, okay. yeah. A tax avoidance rule contains underkill. There are some caps, some misfits. The tax generator wants to attack certain tax planning structures, but some situations are outside the scope. And it can be done explicitly. Yeah, the legislator can say, well, for this group of companies, we won't apply the tax avoidance measure. But it can also be more implicit. It can also be that the, the law has been drafted in such a way that there are some some gaps in the law, some situations that were not maybe not foreseen or 
where for she, but the legislator said, well, okay, well, we just leave that. And of course, no, no, no legislation in the world is perfect. So you, you will always find some in, in, uh, imperfections also in tax avoidance measures. The question is, if a taxpayer relies on this gap, or exemption, let's call it a gap in a tax avoidance measure, can that constitute then a selective treatment? The Commission has stated in its notice from 2016 that indeed anti-abuse rules might be selective if they provide for a derogation to specific undertakings or transactions which would not be consistent with the underlying logic of the anti-abuse rule. So what the Commission said, if you exclude a certain group which doesn't make sense from the rationale of your measure, that may be selective. And I, I, I think that makes sense, but the question is how far should you go? Must it be explicit? Must it be an explicit derogation? Or it's also a, 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 a gap of uh, 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 wrong legislation. Can that also already give rise to selectivity? But an interesting sample which is now um, studied by the Commission is the, uh, C, the, the UK infringement procedure, or an uh, opening, stated opening decision, against the CFC um, anti avoidance rules. Um, under the CFC rules in the UK, if a UK parent holds a foreign subsidiary, and this foreign subsidiary carries on financing activities, which are loaded debt, then the UK CFC rules will apply, which basically means that all the income of the CFC, the subsidiary, will be attributed, picked up by the UK. And Yes, accordingly, provided that the activities of the subsidiary are financed by UK resources, UK funds. And the underlying idea is that the CFC rule should avoid that UK profits are shifted, diverted to low tax jurisdiction subsidiaries, where, for example, where subsequently the CFC starts to lend out these funds to other other parties through, 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 through the provision of, uh, of loans. However, one exception applies. Intra group financing activities carried on by the CFC, they fall under a special paragraph. If the CFC carries on intra group financing activities, only 25% of the CFC interest income will be attributed to the UK. So not 100% pick up, only 25% pick up. Why? Because the UK government said, well, in the case of multinationals, it will be extremely difficult to figure out, to trace the origin of the funds um, um, uh, landed by the CFC. And it's extremely difficult to trace whether these funds find their origin in the UK. Because remember, the CFC rule only applies if the profits originally were yeah, originated in the UK. And this is for, for multinationals very difficult, if not impossible. Therefore, we apply a, for the sake of admission, for the sake of simplicity, we apply a simple practical benchmark, which is 25%, which is a reasonable estimation of the outcome that would be attained, obtained if we would have applied the, the, the real difficult rule. Because that's too difficult, we will kind of do a good best estimate, which is 25%. How should we assess that argument? We want to keep the thing simple. We don't want to make life too, too complicated. I think it may be a valid argument. But the Commission will then look, okay, you're good, but why are you doing this only for multinational group, eh, for intercompany group financing activities? Isn't the same problem there for other companies that don't fall under the exception? So please explain. And if the UK can't really convince the Commission here, then I bet, I'm afraid that the Commission will say, well, we don't believe you. The argument you're putting forward, administrative simplicity, if you apply that, then you have to do it consistently for all the other entities that suffer from the CFC rule as well. And if you're doing that, yeah, the policy objective is not the real one. So I think here, and 
there's more, much more to say, but I'm, I know I'm a bit time constrained, so I will leave it here. The, the real question here is, so is, what is the real reason for this under, for, for this underkin? Is there a real text, Polish objective lying behind that? Or is there a hidden other reason behind the exemption for group funding activities? And this is, I think, where the Commission will now start to, to investigate in more detail to find out the real policy reason here. Daniel, yeah. one more example. And then we stop. <laughs> then, well, then I go to the example of uh, where you started, uh, Peter. Starbucks and, uh, and, and, and Apple. And I just want to make two, two short comments. I, I assume you all more or less know where the Apple Amazon is, uh, where those cases are all, all, all about. Where all, um, and essentially, those cases have two things in common. First, they all have in common that the European Commission is supplying or assessing selectivity not against a domestic rule, but against a European benchmark. The Commission is testing whether member states deviate from a European arm's length principle. That's the first one. I think this is a more legal issue. There's also a political issue, that, which Peter already pointed out. In all these cases, if you look to the bigger picture, you see that the downward transfer pricing adjustment in the member state at stake is not neutralized by a corresponding levy in any, any of the other states, mainly in the US. And this, this indeed was explained by Peter. The US obviously does not tax offshore profits. It only taxes profits when they are distributed back to the US. So if you look to the bigger picture, there is an overall bilateral tax benefit. It's not only the fact that the profits in, U, in, in the EU are reduced, but it's also the fact that there's no pickup, corresponding pickup, in the US. And this combination, the use of those two different systems, boils down to an overall tax benefit. Um, and I think this is more a political thing. This is not what the Commission has legally argued of being uh, falling under the scope of state. But if you read press releases, every time you see coming back the fact that profits eventually are taxed nowhere. So politically, this seems to be really an issue for the Commission. And now that indeed the question that comes up, what about the US tax reform impact? Because under the US rules, as they have been uh, being applied as of this year, actually all those retained profits, those profits that fall between the in, in the ocean, so to speak, will now be picked up with retroactive effect immediately at once in the US against a relatively lower rate, but still everything is taxed. So the bilateral benefit is no longer there. What does that mean legally? And what does this mean politically? I just will raise the question and not go into detail because I know there are other speakers. But this will, at least I know from my experience, that this question is really, really an emerging question made by U.S. multinationals. Because they feel if there is tax agent in the U.S., there should be no advantage anymore. We are paying our tax, so the state aid um, uh, rules should no longer apply. I think legally that's not... Right, but maybe politically, indeed, that would, could be the case. To conclude, well, indeed, I think those examples demonstrate that member states are indeed restricted to some extent in their choice how and whether, whether and how to design tax avoidance measures. But it's still difficult to say to which extent. And I summarize the questions which relate to all specific cases in the, uh, in the subsequent bullets, which I won't repeat them, but they just summarize essentially what the cases I just discussed are all about. Um, I have to stop, so I will. <laughs> I thank you for your attention, and um, I hand over the mic to uh, Peter. Thank you very much.